Hello Hans, I've been looking forward to this moment for quite some time now. Thanks again for making this possible. It's a real honor having you at the Congress. In the next 30 minutes, we want to have a look into the history of mountain biking. This history now goes back almost 50 years. Please tell us, what were the beginnings? How did it all start? Well, the beginnings uh, really started when the bicycle was invented, <laughs> you know, like back uh, over 100 years ago because there was no roads. But there came a, a boom and that started the mountain bike boom when people started to ride these clunker bikes, these cruisers with balloon tires. And there was a group in Northern California or several groups and they used to get together and hammer down these hills and started doing some races. And some of those guys were the, the fathers of mountain biking like Gary Fisher and Joe Breeze, Otis Guy or Charles Kelly and, and a bunch more. And they just had this... I don't know if they were inspired by motorcycle racing and maybe a little bit by BMX and they wanted to be like kids on bikes again in the dirt and they started riding these bigger adult bikes and the next thing you know is you know these guys would modify the bikes and start building their own because there was no mountain bikes at the time and eventually um, Gary and Charles Kelly started a company called Mountain Bike and and they had this really small production, you know, a little shop like my garage here where they would make like five bikes a month or so, you know. But then came Mike Sinyard and he's the founder and owner of Specialized. And he started uh, building actually the first production mountain bike in Japan. And from there on, uh, the floods gate were open and the sport started to evolve, even though the boom didn't happen until the early 90s. Sounds that these bikes didn't have so much in common with modern bikes. How did the bikes look uh, at those times and what did people do with it? Well, people just started to improvise. You know, they took existing bikes and those were those clunker bikes, the cruisers with the balloon tires, and they started to modify it and ch changing parts and angles. And back in those days, these guys would get together on a regular basis and do these races, the repack race, they called it. And that was at Mount Tam, which is now officially known as the birthplace of mountain biking. That's also where the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame is. And they would hammer down these mountains, but these coaster brakes and all that stuff wouldn't really last. They would break and they would have to repack the brakes. And that's why the race is called repack. But then riders would come from other areas in the bay, in the, you know, from Southern California or from, from the Cupertino riders or different guys would come and they would all race in that race. And slowly bikes got better. They got improvised. People started building their own frames. And I mean, Let's just call my friend Otis. He's one of the old timers who was there. He runs the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame and he can maybe show us uh, the museum right there and tell us how it all went down. Hi, my name is Otis Guy. Uh, we are here at the Marine Museum of Bicycling, which also houses the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame. And I'm very lucky to be here with Joe Breeze and we're doing a video for Hans Ray, which will be used at a German conference. So uh, welcome Germany to our little talk with Joe. Yeah, hi, Joe Brees, uh, with my good friend Otis Guy, who I used to ride with way back when in the early 70s with Mark Venditti uh, on Mount Tamalpais, having that, those first initial days of mountain biking for us on our backyard, in our backyard. And so for us, we were both, all of us were road riders, including you know, Gary Fisher, Mark Vendetti, myself, Joe. So for us, cycling was already part of us. And we discovered through Mark uh, mountain bikes, and we started riding them together with him in October of 1973. And, and being competitive guys, uh, eventually somebody's going to say, "Well, you know, I'm fastest," and so somebody's you're going to have to prove it, right? And uh, it was Charlie Kelly and Fred Wolf who came up with the uh, repack race out west of town. This this uh, initial downhill. A two mile downhill, 1300 foot drop uh, to determine who was the fastest. And you can see here, these are the bikes in those early days that we're riding. No suspension. Uh, this is a 41 Schwinn here with a strap on cantilevers from the 50s. It's using a Moro kickback brake here with a big chain ring. We've, we found smaller cogs back there to go f faster down that hill. And those are the Charlie got uh, digital timers that they use for timing us. 
Uh, Gary Fisher has the fastest time, Joe has the second fastest, and I have the third fastest. What makes this more fascinating is that nobody's beating our times. There are people like within a couple seconds of it, but you would think for like modern tires and suspension, we're riding you know, Levi's, no helmets, garden gloves, and we're flying down this descent on these bikes that basically are brakelesses. Um, but for whatever reason, they still can't beat our times. Uh -huh. Well, it, it, we should point out too that we weren't the first people riding off-road. People have been riding off-road since the advent of bikes, right? Uh, it just goes, goes together. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't uh, paved roads so much back then. People were riding off-roads and doing some amazing stuff off-road too for quite some time. And, uh, but this uh, early 70s time, uh, we, were, we had seen guys from the 60s uh, doing this on Mount Tam, and there were guys from the 30s doing it on Mount Tam, and I'm sure there were people doing it all across the country on these old newsboy bikes as soon as that balloon tire existed, and, and in, in, in Europe as well. Uh, so what we were doing here was nothing new, but we were doing it with such a fervor that repack really became the very crucible of mountain biking. And this is where it uh, brought us together on a regular basis to share our love of this new kind of bike and, uh, and brought in the, uh, people who filmed us and shared it with the rest of the country and the world and uh, made it go far and wide from right from here on Mount Tunnel Park. And I think the thing that really helped was we were all committed to cycling, not only cycling a, a road, but later on mountain bikes and also cycling as transportation. So we weren't going to get our driver's license and get a car and stop riding our bikes. We love bikes. Yeah. The self-sufficiency aspect was a really important element to the whole movement. And so, and it was fun. <laughs> that was like the best part of us. <laughs> yeah. And, but it, and it wasn't obvious to us, you know, we were just, started out doing this, uh, having fun in our backyard, but uh, it became interesting that the, our non-cycling friends might come up to us and ask to ride our bikes, and invariably, they'd come back with a big smile on their face saying, where has this bike been? And to, to give you some idea how we didn't think a whole lot of it initially, I remember talking to Otis, we were out on a ride up to the top of Mount Tam, covered head to toe, middle of one winter, and I'm, we're, we're sitting down looking out over the San Francisco Bay, and I, I say to Otis, you know, this year is a whole lot of fun, but who else is going to want to do this? <laughs> it turned out that more and more people all over the world discovered this special kind of fun for themselves. Hans, you came to America shortly after the first repack races in 1987, I think. Um, how did you remember this era? Well, yes, I was, um, obviously I grew up in, in Europe and I was a trials rider and trials was actually a European sport. And an American trials rider used to come to Europe where we had the biggest competitions and the best riders were all from Europe. And he, he told me one time, Hans, there's a new sport in America, it's called mountain biking. And they always have trials in it as a discipline. So in the old days when you raced, you had to do cross country, downhill and trials all on the same bike in the same race and he said but they don't really uh, have really good trials riders there you need to come and show them what real trials riding is and, and at that point I was just starting to go to university and I thought this would be a great way to end my career in Europe and I, I, I figured let's go to America check it out and I arrived here and the floodgates just opened I got thrown into this world that I couldn't have imagined. You know, I got introduced to sponsors. I got sponsorships with GT and Swatch, and I got to meet all these BMX uh, legends that I used to read in the magazines about. And I got introduced to the Laguna Beach Rats. And the Laguna Beach Rats is one of these original mountain bike clubs. They started shortly after the guys in Marine County. And for the last 40 years, they've been riding every Wednesday, and I'm still riding with them today every Wednesday every week and these guys really made me a real mountain biker and these guys kind of are the original the original free riders really they kept that mountain bike spirit from the early days of having fun and going out there um, alive and it was a very exciting time to be part there because this was shortly like two or three years later after I came to America then the boom really kicked off and that was the golden era of mountain biking and and it was really 
nice or you know everybody who was part of that you know say that's like the highlight of of the whole mountain bike history because it was so new and nobody knew what to expect and there was like new inventions new riders new faces nobody you know everybody just wanted to go out and had fun and and one thing led to the next and the next thing you know is the boom was in full swing boom. wow sounds like really exciting times at the beginning of the 90s, mountain biking then really kicked off and became more and more popular. The sport changed and free riding was born. Um, tell us about this moment. How did this happen? Well, the, it was a natural evolution. I remember um, it, in, in the early days, it was mountain biking was all about racing and about stopwatches and Lycra. And I remember I used to watch these extreme ski films where guys would jump off cliffs and I go like, wow, I want to use my trial spiking skills in situations like this. So I don't want to be a mountain bike racer anymore. I want to become an extreme mountain biker. And this was literally five years before the word free ride was even coined. You know, the free ride movement started way later and we started doing these extreme biking videos. I was heavily influenced by the Laguna Rats who would ride the steepest trails and all the crazy stuff. And the next thing, you know, is um, free ride really became something and it, and it really kind of started to explode in British Columbia and Canada, where a bunch of these um, skiers and bike riders started doing mountain biking stuff and, and filmmakers from up there would start making films. And one particular group, the Fro Riders, um, uh, would become like the poster child for this whole movement. And there was something new and fresh and they brought a new attitude to the sport. At this point, mountain bikes had evolved. All of a sudden now we had full suspension bikes. Before that, mountain bikes didn't have full suspension. So with a full suspension bike, you could do much bigger things and crazier things. And the whole video DVD uh, movement started to explode. And it, this was still before Internet. So uh, Brad Tippy is one of those guys who was there. And uh, let's see what he says. It was a crazy time because, you know, racing was very popular, very, uh, very much back then. And people were in Lycra and there, everyone's on the clock and it's all about fitness and your engine and how much you could pedal. And, you know, I didn't really want to do that. I, wa I wanted to go out and to see how aggressive a train I could ride and how big a cliff I could jump off of. And it was a totally different train of thought where it was all about the fun and the thrill of it rather than the fitness of it. And people, you know, like me and, 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 and like you and like others, we're all about into the, the, the ability to ride new terrain and have fun doing it. And it was quite scary because, you know, the bikes weren't really ready yet for what we were doing and we were jumping off things. And it was kind of like le leaping into the unknown of riding these aggressive Kamloops hoodoo cliffs or, or steeply steep rocks in, in North Vancouver. And it was very much, uh, very much pioneering, uh, and, and, and trying to outdo each other to see what was possible and breaking bikes and fixing bikes and breaking bikes and breaking ourselves and getting healthy and then trying it again. And it was a crazy time. It was unknown and uh, I absolutely loved it. The reception in the early days was mixed, you know, like the, the local girls thought it was cool. And, and you know, they, <laughs> we were cool dudes because we were doing badass stuff. But a lot of the people in the industry thought we were crazy and we were actually frowned upon by a lot of people that were, you know, evolved with IMBA or our trail associations because we were riding off trail and we were very, very bad people because we weren't on the trails, but the trails back then weren't aggressive enough for what we wanted to do. So we had to ride off trail or make our own trails or just find some big mountain terrain to ride down because that's what was, was giving us the thrill of, of, of giving her. And um, for that, we got a lot of repercussions and, and we're branded as, as crazy or, or bad, but um, you know, to, to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. So we, we crack some eggs. <laughs> you know, it created a lifestyle about having fun and mountain biking for the pure, pure sport of having wind in your face and the adrenaline given her and, and not being on the clock and not being, in, you know, in a competitive format. Although, you know, we're dudes or, 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 or hardcore uh, ladies. So it's always kind of competitive in some way, but it's like competitive in a different way. It's not how fast you are. It's not getting a good time. It's having a good time. And, um, you know, I think that if someone didn't pioneer it like we did, then it would have been someone else eventually. But, you know, we were there and we were the ones that kind of like took to it and, and made it what it is and or helped make it what it is. We, the different pieces of the puzzle, different had different styles that formated 
you know, creating, uh, riding for fun and free riding and, and riding more aggressive stuff. So, um, it was kind of scary, but, uh, it was super fun. And, you know, if I had to do it again, I'd do it exactly the same way. I just love listening to Brad TV. Sounds like really crazy times uh, back then. We're going to switch to German now. In 1982, Wolfgang Renner brought the first mountain biking to Germany. Then mountain biking developed in Germany. How do you remember that time, Hans? Well, in Germany, the boom started in the early 1990s when the bike magazine came on the market. Uli Stanzio was the publisher, or rather the editor-in-chief. He created the bike magazine, and that was practically the Bible for all mountain bikers. They set the tone. But even before that, in the mid-1980s, Wolfgang Renner, who later owned the bike brand Centurion and also Merida, he had already brought BMX to Germany in the early 1980s. He triggered the BMX boom. He was a big fan of mountain bikes. I remember reading an article published in Germany um, in a magazine in 1985. It was an article about balloon bikes and this trend. I wasn't really interested in 26-inch bikes that like that. We still rode 20-inchers at the time. But Wolfgang had a vision. He took the mountain bike, literally, Literally into the mountains. That means he was already doing expeditions to the Himalayas and so on back then. That was way before the time, long before people started traveling the world on bikes. Well, basically, everything started with this bike. When I rode through the Carwendel Valley for the first time in 1976, I realized that it was probably not the right thing to do with my cross bike. Then I saw the clunkers in Long Beach, then I made a little drawing. The Japanese then built me the first mountain bike in 1981-82, which came onto the market. We rode this bike through Tibet in 1987. That was an expedi expedition with Andy Hackmeyer from Lhasa to Kathmandu over 5,000 meter high passes. In the years that followed, I did many expeditions. I was, so to speak, lucky to be born early. German Chancellor at the time, Helmut Kohl, once said, the Glück der späten Geburt, grace of late birth. I had the grace of early birth. There were still many white spots on the map. With a big, then a big wave started when the Alps were crossed for the first time. And I laid the foundation for the first bike trans Alp with my friend Uli Stanzio in the Napa Valley, together with him, or let's say rather he did it. I also have to mention Hans Ray again. In the beginning, he made the trial sport big in Germany. Then he went to America. We sponsored him as a very young rider. Uli Stanzio got the whole wave rolling by founding the bike magazine. I had the idea for the Trans Alp back in June 1989 already, when we had just founded the bike magazine. I went on a big Carl Wendell tour with a friend. During this tour, we had the idea well, why don't we just ride further south until we reach southern Tyrol or Lake Garda? We didn't do it because we didn't know where we should have gone, where we should have driven through. No one knew that at the time. But in the following year, the time had come. In July 1990, the three of us set off. We drove across the Alps from Mittenwald to Bolzano. We had great weather and great experiences. When I think about it today, I still get goosebumps. We published it in March 1991. We got a huge response to it. Shortly afterwards, Andy Heckmeyer, the mountain guide from Oberstdorf in Germany, called me. He said, Uli, I've, got, I've done something like that before. And I said, give me the story. We published this story about half a year later. That started an avalanche. It was unimaginable. 
our readers all wanted to copy something like that. We went back every year. Wolfgang Renner was always with us. He was always part of it. He had a lot of touring experience. He was also the first mountain bike producer in Germany. He's also a great body. Until 1997, we rode a Transalp together every year. During that time, I had the idea that we could make an event or a race out of it. As luck would have it, I met Wolfgang Renner in the spring of 1997 in the Napa Valley at a Bike World Cup. We sat down together in a restaurant in the evening, we had a bottle of wine together, and I presented him with the idea. Couldn't we set up something like a trans up challenge? And he said, well, if you do that, I'll be your first sponsor. That's how the bike trans up got started. In the years that followed, it became probably the most important mountain bike race in the world and has been copied many times. I had my first experience on the mountain bike back in 1985. At that time I was still editor-in-chief at Surf Magazine and I immediately recognized that mountain biking had huge potential. It offered exactly the same freedom and independence that windsurfing did. There we were free of rules. It was not about training and physical exercise, but rather about playing with the forces of nature. I then presented the idea to the publishing house that we should make a magazine out of it. At that time, there was still a bit of a, well, couple stick to your last mentality. Do we really want to start something so completely new? But with my power of persuasion, I somehow got everyone on board. And in May 1989, the first bike magazine came out. It was a sensational success. We doubled the circulation in the first year already. Well, it covered important topics such as technology, of course, but then also riding techniques. No one knew how to mountain bike yet. We had to learn that first, and that's when a young guy caught my eye, Hans Ray. He had become trial world champion. He was able to show us things in terms of riding techniques. That was unbelievable. I did then a series, a story with him right at the beginning um, on driving technique, on riding techniques that we also published in 1990. That was a huge success. I mean, buddy hop jumping. If I think of that, that was a sensation back then. Today, everyone can do it. I went on from there. I then had the idea of organizing a bike festival so that our readers not only get beautifully printed papers, but that they could also have their own experiences together with the stars, whom they would otherwise never have been able to see anywhere. Of course, we also invited Hans Ray. He showed great stunts shows in Riva del Garda. That's how Lake Garda became the great biking mecca that it is today. Bike magazine still exists, the bike festival still exists, bike transalp still exists. So those were all ideas and creations that have existed for years and hopefully will continue to exist for a long time. During that time, the foundation was really laid out for a lot of things that still exist in the bike world today. The Transalp belonged to the Ecolette for bikers for a long time and is still one of the great bike dreams today. Hans, you were on the road a lot in America at that time. How did you experience the development there in the 1990s? I was able to make a name for myself in America very quickly at the end of the 1980s. When Uli Stanzio came to America for the first time, I was almost, uh, well, a household name, to, so to speak. They asked themselves, well, what is the German Swiss doing in America? Everybody knows him there. Of course, with Uli, I was at the right address for Germany. We then did a huge technique story, um, riding technique story, a book was made out of it. I then did trial shows all over the world, including Europe. It was all there. I also went to the Eurobike, etc. That was before the internet boom. Then it went full throttle. A few years later, I made the first videos. Nobody knew that kind back then. There was no such thing. There was no internet, no YouTube.
Mountain biking was hardly ever on TV. If it was, then it was just a boring cross-country cross race. I was the first to make videos like that, extreme biking with lifestyle and fun. That was one of the milestones for me. And then after that, the whole sport developed rapidly. Well, crazy 90s, really. Meilensteine, milestones in English is a good keyword. At the end of the 90s, beginning of the new millennium, what was pushing the development of biking at this time? Well, yeah, um, the sport and the bikes, uh, the development was crazy, you know, new materials, new suspension, new technology. And the first like 20 years was really about the bike technology. But then we came into an era when it started to become more about where we ride and how we ride and that was the era when of purpose-built trails you know in the early 90s there was a guy david davis in wales who started building these trail centers in the uk with purpose-built trails before that we mountain bikers would ride anywhere they just give us a hill and we ride it we, any road any trail we didn't know it could be much better until people started building those trails and that was kind of the beginning of bike parks and like for example Didi Schneider from Germany was one of those early pioneers with the vision he built a bike park in Germany at the same time then Whistler started and his bike park was actually as much as it was very small and very remote it was very um, very good and um, so this was kind of the new trend to start doing um, destinations with a really good product and infrastructure and I mean and that's what really the last 20 years have been about and it's really a good time to be a mountain biker now because our sport is in such a great uh, position and simultaneously we developed all these subcultures within our sport you know there was the single speed guys and the marathon guys and the fat tire guys and the dirt jumpers and then the enduro guys and now we have the uh, e-bikers so there is um, a lot of cultures and they all have their own kind of philosophies their own bikes their own fashion their own styles and um, they could all blossom next to each other and that's kind of the beauty about mountain bikes that we have that anybody can do it the way they prefer to do it. This is a really beautiful description of what mountain biking is and means to a lot of people all over the globe. Then really mountain biking became really, really big. In your point of view, why and how did this happen? Yeah, the sport um, all of a sudden got really big and it went into many different directions. and. Part of it was, you know, all of a sudden we were in the X Games and we were, there was festivals everywhere and there was videos and then there was like um, um, Olympics eventually and, and all these things and, and people really, everybody kind of got aware of that mountain bike, that new thing and how cool it was and, and with this opened the doors for tourism and all of a sudden destinations started to uh, realize this as a kind of a business and we had some incredible examples you know like initially when you were thinking mountain biking you would think St. Moritz, Kitzbühel or places like this in the Alps but all of a sudden there was places in the uh, in the Bavarian forest or in Czechoslovakia or in Wales that you never heard of and you would have never thought about going there but these people started building bike trails and that's what the bikers wanted they wanted infrastructure and i remember we we, we started a, a an early project in in the altarezia region which is partly in the engadin in switzerland and partly in the valtellina in italy and we this was at the time when the ski lifts started to open up for bikers and the ski resorts all of a sudden saw a summer business opportunity but also the heavier free ride bikes came to Europe and those bikes were really make, made to ride downhill, not so much uphill. It was hard work. So in those days, you know, people would say, well, if you want to ride downhill, you have to earn it to get up the hill first and pedal. But then uh, Thomas Frischnecht, who was one of the greatest cross country racers of all time, and myself, we did this Altarezia free ride tour with these free ride bikes and we would shuttle up we do the six day tour take shuttles take the train take the the ski lifts and all of a sudden some of those critical swiss people would be like well if thomas frischnecht can take the lift we can take it maybe sometimes too and it kind of 
you know, we weren't the first to do that, but we, this was kind of the time when this kind of writing was acceptable and started to, to work. And that's how, how it opened the door for tourism. In the last five to ten years, um, we see, really see a big mountain bike boom in a lot of tourism destinations. A lot of this boom is also driven by the e-mountain bike. Um, the e-mountain bike is seen at some, from some bikers, especially from the sporty guys and girls, uh, very critical and with a lot of skepticism. Uh, what do you think about the e-mountain bike and its potential for tourism? Well, the, the e-mountain bike I think it's it's a great addition to mountain bikes. I want to make it clear it, it has to be the category one pedal assist bike. I'm not a fan of the ones with the throttle or the motorcycles or the, the ones with too much power. But the pedal assist bike, um, it is such a fun way to ride the bike and it takes a little bit of focus away from you don't have to be super fit and trust me, you still get a workout. But I just think it opens the opportunities of what can be done and who can do it and how it can be done. And there's all new challenges come with that. You know, for me, for example, when I ride my e-bike now and I still ride my regular bike just as much, believe me, but I like these really technical steep climbs, you know, and challenge myself. Stuff that I always had to push up before or carry my bike. Now I'm pedaling it up on the e-bike and I think... Um, E-bikes are definitely here to stay. We, made, we need to make sure that we are represented right, that people understand the e-bikes and that also the riders um, follow the rules and um, integrate with all these other trail users which are out there, you know, because uh, we cannot just come in and take over. We need to respect uh, what's there, nature and rules. True. <laughs> Not only in the beginning of this Congress, we've been thinking a lot about where this growth is leading us, us to. Is there a limit of growth and uh, of credibility? Um, in your point of view, where, what is necessary to make biking sustainably possible for this growing community? Well, it's very important that we educate uh, the mountain bikers, but also the general public, you know, and we need to be represented when there is local or even domestic meetings where mountain biking decisions are made. Mountain bikers need to sit on the table and and have explained to the people how it works, lobby basically for us. At the same time, we need to teach all the new mountain bikers. So many people have discovered the mountain bike, especially with the pandemic, but they don't know the rules. They don't know the etiquette. They don't know how to interact with other trail users or we respect the nature. And that is something that is up to us mountain bikers to make sure that we fit into this. We don't own the mountains for ourselves. We share them and we need to respect um, nature, trail users and the rules, you know, otherwise, you know, all this can come to an end. And it's, it's really a really good time to be a mountain biker right now, you know, and I want you to be part of this. Yeah, so true what you say about uh, lobbying and education. This is what we try to work on day by day at the Mountain Bike Tourism Forum. Looking to the future of mountain biking, Hans, what do you think, uh, what will the future of mountain biking hold? I think the mountain biking will start evolving in all different directions. We're going to have technology will grow, the way we ride will grow, there will be more and more subcultures. I mean, I could have never dreamt in my wildest dream what has happened in the last 25, 30 years. In that short time, you know, like I would have never thought there would be a 12,000 euro mountain bike or that somebody would do a double backflip on a mountain bike or that there is rampage style competitions or that there is whole bike parks popping up all over the world with beautiful purpose-built trails. So um, I think e-bikes will be a big part of this and we have to integrate them and they will bring a lot more people to the sport, but all these other subcultures will always be there. To be a bit like the music industry, one guy might be into reggae, the next guy into punk rock, the next guy into country or classical music. They all have their little subcultures and biking is, is very much the same. Happy trails, my friends. Hans, thank you so much for all these insights on the history of mountain biking and that you took us along for a while on this really exciting journey. We're going to see you tonight again uh, in a more personal talk on your personal biography. What are you going to tell us and what do we gonna going to see? Yeah, I'm going to be back with one of my talks. I have a 
I had an incredible career as a mountain biker and I will take you a little bit through my career, my highlights, my some of my adventure trips. You know, I've been doing almost 50 adventure trips with my mountain bike over the years, but I've done so many other things like from riding with presidents to um, riding at the Olympics and just tell my story, you know, come back. It's kind of a journey through the history of mountain bikes at the same time. I hope to see you tonight.